Hey, welcome to A Foreigner in the Philippines. I'm just looking through one of my favorite books, uh, The Passages of Heaven, and um, I thought I'd give you uh, little excerpts so that you can get the story, but not the entire thing, and I'll fill in on the bits. But this particular one, it's about um, a very special place that, uh, that Steinbeck called the, this is John Steinbeck's work, by the way, and he called it the pastures of heaven and all of the stories are about the people that live in the pastures of heaven and one uh, let me give you the the start now and get on to it uh, pat humbert's parents were middle-aged when he was born they had grown old and stiff and spiteful before he was 20. all of pat's life had been spent in an atmosphere of age of the aches and illnesses of the complaints and self-sufficiency of age while he was growing up, his parents held his opinions in contempt because he was young. When you've lived as long as we have, you'll see things different, they told him. Later, they found his youth hateful because of its, it was painless. Their age, so they implied, was a superior state, a state approaching Godhead in dignity and infallibility. infallibility. Even rheumatism was desirable at the price for the great wisdom of age. Pat was led to believe that no young thing had had any virtue. Youth was a clumsy, fumbling preparation for excellent old age. Youth should think of nothing but the duty it owed to age, of the courtesy and veneration due to age. On the other hand, age owed no courtesy whatever to youth. So Pat was 16 and the whole work of the farm fell upon him. His father retired to a rocking chair beside the airtight stove in the sitting room from which he issued orders, edicts and criticisms. The Humberts dwelled in an old rambling farmhouse of five rooms, a locked parlour, cold and awful as doom, a hot stuffy sitting room smelling always of pungent salves and patent medicines, two bedrooms and a large kitchen. The old people sat in cushioned rocking chairs and complained bitterly if Pat did not come in from the farm work to replenish the fire in the stove several times a day. Towards the end of their lives they really hated Pat for being young. They lived a long time. Pat was 30 when they died, within a month of each other. They were unhappy and bitter and discontented with their lives, and yet each one clung tenaciously to the poor spark and only died after a long struggle. So what happens is that, uh, that Pat grows up in the shadow of these two bitter people, and all they do is sitting there rocking chairs in this stuffy uh, sitting room and complain to him and even though they could get up and stoke the fire themselves they would expect that he would come in from his farm work and that was the life that he had of bitterness of the invalidation of his age of refusing to listen to anything not even hearing anything that he said and they struggled on and kept on and then finally they died one after the other very very quickly so when everything had all gone through Pat stood quietly by the graveside while his, his neighbours shaped up a tent of earth. Although his mother's grave had sunk a little leaving a jagged crack all around its mound the men were patting the new mound now drawing a straight ridge pole and smoothing the slope of the sides. They were good, work, good workmen with the soil. They liked to make a good job, whether it be for a furrow or grave mound. After it was perfect, they still walked about, patting it lightly here and there. The women had gone back to the buggies and were waiting for their husbands to come. Each man walked up to Pat and shook his hand and murmured some solemn, friendly thing. The wagons and surreys and buggies were all moving away now, disappearing one in the distance after the other. Still, Pat stood by the cemetery, by the grave, staring at the two graves. 
He didn't know what to do now. There was no one to demand anything of him. Fall was in the air, the sharp smell of it and the little jerky winds of it breathing up and then dying in mid-blow. Wild, wild doves sat in a line on the cemetery fence, all facing one way, all motionless. A piece of old brown newspaper scudded along the ground and clung about Pat's ankles. He stooped and picked it up, looked at it for a moment and then threw it away. So, what happened next was that they, they were, they were in the ground. They were gone, but still, he could hear the voices. They haunted him. There'll be frost. Through his lethargy, Pat heard the clopping of the horses' hooves on the road, the crying of night birds, and the whisk of wind through the drying leaves. But more real to him were his parents' voices sounding in his head. There'll be frost, his father said. I hate the frost, worse than rats. And his mother chimed in. Speaking of rats, I have a feeling there's rats in the cellar. I wonder if Pat has set the wraps this year. I told him to, but he forgets everything I tell him. Pat answered the voices. I put poison in the cellar. Traps aren't as good as poison. A cat is best, his mother's whining voice said. I don't know why we never had a cat or two. Pat never has a cat. I get cats, mother, but they eat gophers and go wild and run away. I can't keep cats. The house was black and unutterably dreary when he arrived. Pat lighted the reflector lamp and built a fire in the stove to warm the kitchen. As the flames roared through the wood, he sank into a chair and found out he was very comfortable. It would be nice, he thought, to bring his bed into the kitchen and to sleep beside the stove. The straightening of the house could be done tomorrow, or any day for that matter, when he threw open the door into the sitting room. A wave of cold, lifeless air met him. His nostrils were assailed by the smell of funeral flowers and age and medicine. He walked quickly to his bedroom and he carried his cot into the warm and lighted kitchen. After a while, Pat blew out the light and went to bed. The fire cricked softly in the stove. For a time the night was still and then gradually the house began to swarm with malignant life. Pat discovered that his body was tense and cold. He was listening for sound from the sitting room. For the creak of the rocking chairs and for the loud breathing of the old people, the house cracked. And although he had been listening for sounds, Pat started violently. His head and legs became damp with perspiration. Silently and miserably he crept from his bed and locked the door into the sitting room. Then he went back to his cot and lay shivering under the covers. The night had become very still and he was lonely. The next morning Pat awakened with a cold sense of duty to be performed. He tried to remember what it was. Of course, it was the Bible lying off-centre on its table. That should be put straight. The vase of everlastings should be set upright. And after that the whole house should be cleaned. Pat knew that he should do these things in spite of the reluctance he felt for opening the door into the sitting room. His mind shrank from the things that he would see when he opened the door. The two rocking chairs, one on either side of the stove. The pillow in the chair seats would be holding the impressions of his parents' bodies. He knew the odours of age and of unguents and of stale flowers that would be waiting for him on the other side of the door. But the thing was a duty. It must be done. He built a fire and made his breakfast. It was while he drank the hot coffee that a line of reasoning foreign to his old manner of life came to him. The unusual thoughts 
that thronged upon him astounded him at once for their audacity and for their simplicity. Why should I go in there? he demanded. There's no one to care, no one even to know. I don't have to go in there if I don't want to. He felt like a boy who breaks school to walk in a deep and satisfying forest. But to combat his freedom, his mother's complaining voice came to his ears. Pat ought to clean the house. Pat never takes care of things. The joy of revolt surged up in him. You're dead, he said to the voice. You're just something that's happening in my mind. Nobody can expect me to do things anymore. Nobody will ever know if I don't do things I ought to. I'm not going in there. And I'm never going in there. And while the spirit was still strong in him, he strode to the door, plucked out the key and threw it into the tall weeds behind the house. He closed the shutters on all the windows except those in the kitchen and he nailed them shut with long spikes. The joy of his new freedom did not last long. In the daytime the farm work kept him busy but before the day was out he grew lonely for the old duties which ate up the hours and made the time short. He knew he was afraid to go into the house, afraid of those impressions in the cushions and of the disarranged Bible. He had locked up two thin old ghosts, but he had not taken away their power to trouble him. That night, after he had cooked his supper, he sat beside the stove. An appalling loneliness fell like a desolate fog upon him. He listened to the stealthy sounds in the old house, the whispers and the little knockings. So tensely did he listen that after a while he could hear the chairs rocking in the other room. And once he made out the rasping sound of a lid being unscrewed from a jar of salve. Pat could not stand it any longer. He went to the barn, harnessed his horse and drove to the Passages of Heaven general store. Three men sat around the fat-bellied fat stove, contemplating its corrugations with rapt abstractions. They made room for Pat to draw up a chair. None of the men looked at him, because a man in mourning deserves the same social immunities a cripple does. Pat settled himself in his chair and gazed at the stove. Uh, remind me to get some flour before I go, he said. All of the men knew what he meant. They knew he didn't need flour, but each one of them, under similar circumstances, would have made some other such excuse. T.B. Allen, the owner, opened the stove door and looked in and then spat on the coals. A house like that is pretty lonely at first, he observed. Pat felt grateful to him, although his words constituted a social blunder. I'll need some tobacco and some shotgun shells too, Mr. Allen, he said, by way of payment. Well, what happened with Pat was that he remained terrified of the house. The spirits of his parents still haunted him. He could hear the rocking chairs creaking away. He lived in the kitchen. He had his cot in the kitchen. He ate in the kitchen. It was warm. And for a while it helped to stave off the loneliness he felt. But in spite of his craving for company, Pat never became part of any group. When gatherings were over, Pat had done all the helping he would help to clear up. And he stayed like that. People used him mercilessly. They knew that he needed to be occupied. He never went back to the house until it was absolutely necessary. And then he crept past the sitting room that was locked with the chairs rocking. And he slept in the kitchen. When he was working, the terror of being solitary, the freezing loneliness did not attack him. He raised good fruit, but his berries were his chief interest. The lines of supported vines paralleled the country road. Every year he was able to market his berries earlier and earlier. Pat was 40 years old when the Munros came into the valley. 
he welcomed them as his neighbours. Here was another house to which he could go to pass an evening, and since Bert Monroe was a friendly man, he liked to have Pat drop in and to visit. Pat was a good farmer. Bert often asked his advice. Pat did not take very careful notice of May Monroe, except to see and to forget that she was a pretty girl. He did not often think of people as individuals, but rather as antidotes for the poison of his loneliness and escape from the imprisoned ghosts. So one afternoon he was in his garden and he was working on his berry vine. He, kne he kneeled below the, rinds, uh, the rows of vines and dug among the berry roots with a hoe. The berries were fast forming now and the leaves were pale, green and lovely. Pat worked slowly down in the row. He was contented with his work. And as he worked, he heard voices from the road. And although he was concealed among the vines, he knew from the voices that Mrs. Munro and her daughter May were strolling by his house. Suddenly he heard May exclaim with pleasure, Mama, look! Look at that! Pat ceased his work to listen. Did you ever see such a beautiful rose in your life, Mama? It's pretty all right, Mrs. Monroe said. I've just thought what it reminds me of, May continued. Do you remember the postcard of that lovely house in Vermont? Uncle Keller sent it. This house with the rose over it, it looks just like that house in the picture. I'd like to see the inside of the house. Well, there isn't much chance of that, Mrs. Allen. Mrs. Allen says no one in the valley has been in the house since Pat's father and mother died, and that's ten years ago. She didn't say whether it was pretty. With a rose like that on the outside, the inside must be pretty. I wonder if Mr. Humbert would let me see it sometimes. The two women walked on, out of hearing. When they were gone, Pat stood up and looked at the great rose. He had never seen how beautiful it was. A haystack of green leaves and nearly covered with white roses. It is pretty, he said, and it's like a nice house in Vermont. It's like a Vermont house. And, well, it is pretty, a pretty bush. Then, as, no, as though he had seen the bush and through the wall, a vision of the parlour came to him. He went quickly back to his work among the berries, struggling to put the house out of his mind. But May's words came back to him over and over. Pat wondered what a Vermont house looked like. He remembered a picture in a magazine, a room with a polished floor and white woodwork and a staircase. It might have been the Vermont house. That picture had impressed him. Perhaps that was what May meant. So for a while, the idea of showing May the inside of his house started to become a plan. He could not see, he could not sleep for that night. His head was too full of plans. Once he got up and lighted the lamp to look in his bank book. A little before daylight he dressed and cooked his breakfast and while he ate his eyes wandered again to the locked door. There was a light of malicious joy in his eyes. It'll be dark in there, he said. i better rip open the shutters before I go in there. When daylight came at last he took a crowbar and he walked around the house, tearing open the nail shutters as he went. The parlour windows he did not touch because he didn't want to disturb the rose bush. Finally he went back into the kitchen and stood before the locked door. For a moment the old vision stopped him. But it will be just for a minute, he argued. I'll start in tearing it to pieces right away. The crowbar poised and crashed on the lock. 
The door sprang open, crying miserably on its dry hinges, and the horrible room lay before him. The air was foggy with cobwebs. A musty ancient odour flowed through the door. There were the two rocking chairs on either side of the rusty stove, even though through the dust he could see the little hollows in their cushions. But these were not the terrible things. Pat knew where the lay the centre of his fears. He walked rapidly through the room, brushing the cobwebs from his eyes as he went. The parlour was still dark, for its shutters were closed. Pat didn't have to grope for the table. He knew exactly where it was. Hadn't it haunted him for ten years? He picked up the table and the Bible together, ran out through the kitchen, and he hurled them into the yard. Now he could go more slowly. The fear was gone. The windows were stuck so hard that he had to use the bar to pry them open. First the rocking chairs went out, rolling and jumping when they hit the ground. Then the pictures, the ornaments from the mantel, the stuffed aureoles. And then when the moving furniture, the clothing, the rugs and vases were scattered from under the windows. Pat ripped up the carpets and crammed them out too. Finally he brought buckets of water and splashed the walls and ceilings thoroughly. The work was an intense pleasure to him. He tried to break the legs from the chairs when he threw them out. While the water was soaking into the dark old wallpaper, he collected all the furniture from under the windows, piled it high and set fire to it. Old musty fabrics and varnished wood smouldered sullenly and threw out a foul stench of dust and dampness. Only when a bucket of kerosene was thrown over the pile did the flame leap up. The table and chairs cracked as they released their ghosts into the fire. Pat surveyed the joy, the pile joyfully. You would sit in there all those years, wouldn't you? he cried. You thought I'd never get up the guts to burn you. Well, I just wish you could be around now to see what I'm going to do, you rotten stinking trash. The green carpets burned through and left red flaky coals. Old vases and jars cracked to pieces in the heat. Pat could hear the sizzle of mentholatum and painkiller gushing from containers and boiling into the fire. He felt that he was presiding at the death of his enemy. Only when the pile had burned down to, clo to coals did he leave it. The walls were soaked thoroughly by now so that the wallpaper peeled off in long, broad ribbons. And his next duty was to go into Salinas. And he drove into Salinas and he went to the public library and he said, do you have any pictures of Vermont cottages? And the librarian was very helpful and she took him to where the magazines was. And finally, as he's looking through all of the pictures and all the magazines, he comes across one which appeals to him tremendously. It was a beautiful room. And he realized when he looked at the room that this was a room unlike any that he had seen. This was a room where someone had carefully worked out what kind of piece should go in what kind of place. And it was like his room. So he, he bought the magazine later, took the pictures, and he took the one special picture and he went to a special furniture store. And they looked at the pictures and the salesman said, of course, you know, to have the originals would cost you $30,000. Pat was discouraged. But the salesman said, but we could get you fine copies of these. Pat thought about the money and he thought, why not? Why shouldn't I? And he said, order everything exactly as it is now. And that's what they did. After a while, he waited and waited. He made sure that the room was ready. He polished the floor. It shone. He decorated the walls. He opened the windows. He cleaned everything. It was just perfect. And then he got the call saying that the furniture, everything was there. And it took five or six, uh, five or six trips into Salinas to pick up all the pieces. He did it at night so that no one would know. And finally, everything 
was perfect. So this was the way that he ordered his life during the day. He worked on the farm and at night rushed into the house with a feeling of joy. The picture of the completed room was tacked up in the kitchen. He looked at it 20 times and he got everything ready. So, someone at the store said to him, we haven't seen you for a long time. What's been happening? He said, well, I've been studying. I've been studying building. You ought to get married, Pat. You're getting along in years. Pat blushed furiously. Don't be a damn fool, he said. As he worked on the room, Pat was developing a little play and it went like this. The room was finished and the furniture in its place. The fire burned redly. The lamps threw misty reflections on the polished floor and on the shiny furniture. I'll go to her house and I'll say offhand. Uh, I hear you like Vermont houses. Well, I've got a room that's kind of like a Vermont house. The preliminaries were never quite satisfactorily. He couldn't come up on a perfect way of enticing her to his house. He ended up by skipping that part. He could think of it later. Now she was entering the kitchen. The kitchen wouldn't be changed for that would make the other room a bigger surprise. She would stand in front of the door and he would reach around her and throw it open. There was the room, rather dark but full of dark light really. The fire flowed up like a broad stream and the lamps reflected on the floor. You could make out the glazed chins hanging and the fat tiger of the overmantel hooked rug. The pewter glowed with a restrained richness. It was all so warm and snug. Pat's chest contracted with delight. Anyway, she was standing at the door and what would she say? Well, if she felt the way that he did, maybe she wouldn't say anything. She might feel almost like crying. That was peculiar, the good full feeling as though you were about to cry. Maybe she'd stand there for a minute or two just looking and then Pat would say, uh, won't you come in and sit for a while? And of course that would break the spell. She would begin talking about the room in funny choked sentences but Pat would be offhand about it all. Yes, I always liked it. He said this out loud as he worked. Yes, I always thought it was kind of nice. It came to me the other day that you, you might like to see it. The play ended this way. May sat in the wing-back chair in front of the fire. Her plump, pretty hands lay in her lap as she sat there. A faraway look came into her eyes. And Pat never went any farther than that. For at that point a self-consciousness overcame him. If he went farther it would be like peeking in a window at two people who wanted to be alone. The electric moment the palpitating moment of the whole thing was when he threw open the door, when she stood on the threshold, stunned by the beauty of the room. At the end of three months, the room was finished. Pat put the magazine picture in his wallet and went to San Francisco. In the office of a furniture company, he had spread and said, I want furniture like that. Now that he was ready, he paused for a moment. A horrible thought had come to him. Why? She can't come here alone. A girl can't come to a single man's house alone at night. People would talk about her. Besides, she wouldn't do it. He was bitterly disappointed with his play. Her mother will have to come with her, but maybe her mother won't get in the way. She can stand back here, kind of out of the way. Now that he was ready, a powerful reluctance stopped him. Evening after evening passed while he put off asking her to come. He went through his play until he knew exactly where she would stand, how she would look, what she would say. He had alternate things she might say. A week went by 
and still he put off the visit that would bring her to see his room. One afternoon he built up his courage with layers of will. I can't put it off any longer, not forever. I'd better go tonight. After dinner he put on his best suit and set out to walk to the Monroe house. It was only a quarter of a mile away. He wouldn't ask her to come tonight. He wanted to have the fire burning and the lamps lighted when she arrived. The night was cold and very dark. When Pat stumbled in the dust of the road he thought with dismay how his polished shoes would look. There were a great many lights in the Monroe house. In front of the gate, a number of cars were parked. It's a party, Pat thought to himself. I'll ask her some other night. I couldn't do it in front of a lot of people. For a moment, he even considered turning back. It would look funny, though, if, if I asked her the first time I saw her. She might suspect something. When he entered the house... Bert Monroe grasped him by the hand. It's Pat Humpert, he shouted. Where have you been keeping yourself, Pat? I, I've been studying at night. <laughs> well, it's so lucky you came over. I was going to go over to see you tomorrow. You heard the news, of course. What news? Why, May and Bill Whiteside are going to get married next Saturday. I was going to ask you to help at the wedding. It'll just be a home affair with refreshments afterwards. You used to help at the schoolhouse all the time before you got the studying streak. He took Pat's arm and tried to lead him down the hall. The sound of a number of voices came from the room at the end of the hall. Pat resisted firmly. He exerted all his training in the offhand manner. Ah, that's fine, Mr. Monroe. Next Saturday, you say? Oh, I'll be glad to help. No, I can't stay now. Uh, I got to run to the store right away. I shook hands again and walked slowly out the door. In his misery he wanted to hide for a while, to burrow into some dark place where no one would see him. His way was automatically homeward. The rambling house was dark and unutterably dreary when he arrived. Pat went into the barn and with deliberate steps climbed the short ladder and lay down in the hay. His mind was shrunken and dry with disappointment. Above all things he did not want to go into the house. He was afraid he might lock up the door again and then in all the years to come two puzzled spirits would live in the beautiful room and in his kitchen. Pat would understand how they gazed wistfully into the ghost of a fire. Pastures of Heaven. That's um, one heck of a book. Thank you, John Steinbeck, for bringing so much beauty into the world. This is a foreigner in the Philippines. Thanks for listening in on that, if you were able to stay to the end. Bye for now.